Welcome. David Wiss here, registered dietitian, founder of Nutrition in Recovery. Today we're going to talk about night eating syndrome. This is such a fascinating topic given that we only understand it to some extent. There's a lot that goes into this complicated symptom picture and today we're going to touch on some of the highlights. There has been proposed criteria for night eating syndrome, although it did not make it into the DSM-5 as a standalone diagnosis, it's currently nestled under the unspecified eating and feeding disorder category, which means there'll be much more research in upcoming years. Experts agree that it involves morning anorexia, evening hyperphagia, that's excess consumption of food either at night or in the middle of the night, as well as insomnia. Some people report eating to go back to sleep and other people are reporting eating while asleep and not even knowing it, perhaps sleepwalking and finding out in the morning because there was wrappers or even full-blown pots and pans in the kitchen. The proposed criteria suggests that at least 25% of the food intake is consumed after the evening meal. There's a lack of desire to eat in the morning. Breakfast is typically skipped. There's a presence of a belief that one must eat in order to initiate or to return to sleep. And that these authors suggest that the disorder is not secondary to substance abuse, medical disorders, including psychiatric diagnoses, and the use of medications. However, the core clinical features of night eating syndrome include the comorbid conditions such as eating disorders, obesity, depression, insomnia, substance abuse, and anxiety, which makes it tricky sometimes to tease out the primary, secondary diagnoses. There has been assessment tools that have evolved over the last 20 or so years, and the most recent version is from 2008. It's called the Night Eating Questionnaire. It's a 14-item version that hopefully you can find online. Uh, night eating has been studied in a wide range of different populations, and one easy population to study is college students because most research happens at a university. In this one sample of 413 undergrads, they showed that full criteria for night eating syndrome was only met in 1%. So it's relatively rare uh, in quote-unquote normal populations. However, in a psychiatric population, we see prevalences being much higher. In this study, it was just above 12%. And as you can see from the table, the prevalence is even higher in those that have substance use disorder and even higher in those that are in remission, which means those that stop using alcohol and drugs have higher rates of night eating syndrome than those that are currently using. So perhaps this is something that presents itself when people get sober. Other research in psychiatric outpatient populations uh, in Turkey, this sample of 433, found the prevalence to be just above 22%. Uh, these authors found that the night eating syndrome was associated with depression, impulse control disorder, which we discussed in a previous newsletter, as well as nicotine dependency. They also found body dissatisfaction to be an important theme, which is also linked to binge eating disorder which is not the same thing as night eating, but has several areas of overlap, which we will discuss. One interesting part of this study was that the authors showed that there was no difference with regard to the medication being used. However, I'm curious if this would hold true in the United States, where we have much more and different medications being used, particularly for those with substance use disorder. Recently, a review suggested that body temperature dysregulation might be linked into this complicated picture, including sleep disturbance and night eating, etc. There's also some interesting information coming out about circadian rhythms, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done in order to fully understand the spectrum of night eating that exists. Uh, recent reviews suggested that night eating syndrome can be exacerbated during times of major life stress and uncertainty. It's also important to acknowledge that most patients don't bring up these issues because of their own guilt and shame, and that night eating syndrome does respond well to cognitive behavioral therapy. As you can see from the table, binge eating disorder and night eating syndrome have some areas of overlap, but they also have some significant and distinct characteristics by themselves. The overlap includes feeling a loss of control over the episode, so we see this with binge eating, night eating, as well as with substance use disorder. And again, both are associated with increased comorbidity of mood and anxiety symptoms. So it's a tricky thing to treat, it's a tricky thing to address clinically. I certainly had some, some success in my practice. Uh, in order to get into recovery, there's some basics, and everyone's going to respond differently to different things, but a lot of people 
uh, have dieting behaviors, which definitely need to stop in order for the night eating to stop. So this is where some of the CBT skills can come in to help someone cognitively restructure the way they think about food, the way they space their food throughout the day. So I use the mantra, never hungry, never full, to get people to eat regularly throughout the day, sometimes four or five or six times with a balanced intake from all the different macronutrients, that's carbohydrates, protein, and fat. There's no perfect formula um, about the percentage breakdown that I believe in. However, I do think that there should be carbohydrates, protein, and fat at every single meal and every single snack. Food journals can be very helpful, um, self-monitoring and getting support from loved ones. That could be emotional support or actual instrumental or operational support. Um, that has been shown to be useful. Certainly, we need to educate our patients about sleep and circadian rhythms, discuss alcohol. Caffeine is something that can definitely play a role. Uh, drinking too much water before sleep, sometimes people will wake up and then find that now that they're awake, they end up in the kitchen. And other nighttime rituals that could either be uh, detrimental or beneficial. So we need to also discuss relaxation strategies with our patients, including meditation, including regular movement. Uh, I'm a big believer in yoga and I found that to be helpful. Getting people's nervous system to come down and to um, operate more effectively is going to benefit all people and certainly can be helpful at night for those that want recovery from night eating syndrome. This is a very fascinating area of research and I anticipate much more stuff coming out in the near future. If you have questions or comments about this, I'd love to hear from you. Don't hesitate to reach out.